Shall I just pray? So, Lord, take my lips and speak your word through them. Take our minds and think your thoughts through them. And take our hearts, making them a place for your Holy Spirit. وأولين استخلاص في هذه القراءة في اللغة العربية القديس بولوس كتب عن الأساس الإيمان يعني ليس البر من الأعمال الشرعية أو من الجهود الذاتية ولكن بواسطة الألام المسيحي وصليبه وقيامته هذا البر المسيح يأتي لنا من نيمة وفاز الله وبالتدريج أصبح برنا بالأمل الروح القدس فينا وشركتنا في الألم المسيح وموته وقيامته في هذا الطريق نتخذ موتنية السماوات موتنيت السماوات والقيدة بدأ الحياة المسيحية والمعرفة تقدم في هذه الحياة والقربة دليل وصال مع المسيح باب السيوم در زبان فارسي خلاصة پیش ميكنا در اینجا مقدس پولوس بیان بنیاد ایمان مارا کار که پارسای حقیقی از عمل احکام شریعت نمیشه نمیشه یافت بلکه به وسیله ایمان در کار ایسا مسیح یعنی از رنج و سلیب و رستخیز او حاصل میشه این پارسای مسیح به فیض و فضل خدا به طور تدریجی پارسائی ما میشه وقتی کہ ما در رنجش و مرگش و قیامتش قیامت آن شریک میشن میشیم نوٹ جس پرسنل بٹ کوپریٹ عقید آغاز زندگی مسیحی است معرفت ترقی زندگی مسیحی است قربت دلیل وصال با مسیح است So we've come, uh, brothers and sisters, to chapter 3 of this letter to the Philippians. And here the beginning is the end. Because uh, St. Paul actually was thinking of bringing to an end uh, the letter at this point. Finally, my brethren, he says, finally. Akhir kar. I don't know what it is. What is it in Farsi? You won't understand anything if you don't have chapter 3 in front of you. I think keep it there maybe instead of my name. <laughs> it's uh, worth more. <laughs> keep chapter 3. Yeah, that's very good. So he's, he was intending to bring, I mean, it would have been a very short letter if he'd finished there. But this does happen in the Bible. Can anyone remember where else this happens in the Bible. It's in John's Gospel, actually, isn't it? It's the end of chapter 20. It's clear that uh, the Gospel writer is wanting to begin uh, to come to an end. And then he remembers something else, which was another meeting of the risen Lord uh, with his disciples. And so we have chapter 21. Praise the Lord. Alhamdulillah. It's the same here. Something has happened. Something has happened that uh, compels him to continue. Maybe something in Rome, some disturbance for the Christian community in Rome, or it may be in Philippi, something has happened that leads him immediately to warn uh, his people about false teachers. You see, 
In Romans 16, he says, avoid those who teach falsely. Uh, in the second letter to the Thessalonians also, he says, avoid those who are going to mislead you. Don't have fellowship with them. And uh, this also is the case um, in the letters of John, where we are told not even to greet those who might, I mean, it seems a bit hard, but that is what it says. And uh, here is a similar warning. The language is very strong. Sagha. Uh, kalban, yani, uh, dogs, look out for the dogs, those who will tear the fabric of the church. You see. Look out for the evil workers, look out for those who mutilate the flesh. It seems that the heresy here was the old heresy uh, that so threatened the early church. Uh, which required people to become Jews before they could become Christians. And even today, uh, we have people who lay down conditions. You know, um, you have to be good enough, or you have to belong to our church, or you have to give so much money, or, you know, whatever. And against this, uh, Paul, uh, first of all, lays out his own credentials. He is not lacking in anything. It is not because he is lacking in anything that he's giving us this teaching. He, he tells uh, us who he is, uh, circumcised on the eighth day uh, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. So he was not a Greekified, a Hellenized Jew, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Uh, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, uh, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. So he had everything that these people were demanding, and yet he says it is futile to put our trust in these things. Futile to put our trust in these things. Uh, and he says, whatever I had, I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. And again, as you know, this is a very strong word. Khasara, I think, was the word used in Arabic, uh, madam? Khasara. I mean, what does khasara mean? Arabic speakers? Yeah. Yes, it means, yeah. It, it's, uh, it's a stronger word, actually, than loss. It means what you throw out. Fudla. You know. um, what? Sorry? Waste. Yes, waste, yes. We're more refuse. All of that. So whatever our family background, um, whatever our ancestors may position they may have had in society, uh, all of that is counted for nothing as refuse for the sake of Christ. Um, there are some things here that uh, St. Paul is saying which we need to note. And uh, they can be summed up in a few words. There is knowing Christ. There is believing in Christ. Um, there is owning Christ, making what is outside internal to our own lives. Christ in you, the hope of glory, he says in Colossians. Just as we are in Christ, Christ is also in us. There is a mutuality uh, that uh, we note uh, so often in St. Paul. Now, there is a tension between knowing and believing. Which comes first? Do we believe in Christ and then come to know him? Or do we come to know him and then believe in who he is? Uh, I think this is one of these chicken and egg situations. Uh, but both are necessary. Uh, knowing Christ and believing in who he is, as uh, Rico and Shadi were saying yesterday. Uh, this is why I've used these words Aqidah wa ma'rifah 
wa qurba. You see. Believing, knowing, uh, and this is a, uh, I mean, marfa actually is a very good word that is common to all three languages, Arabic, Farsi, and Urdu, uh, which is not just knowing someone casually, but it is a deep knowledge of the spiritual reality. See, uh, English, I don't know if English discernment, I suppose, what would be a good English word, English speakers, for this kind of knowing, a personal knowing? It's what? Oh, yes. Well, that's Greek, of course. Uh, yes, epic. <laughs> um, sorry, sir? Experience. Experience, yes. I think that's, yes, it's experience, but it's, it's at a deep level. It is um, not just a casual encounter, but a deep knowledge of someone. Intimacy. Intimacy, that's a very good word. Yeah, very good word. Um, but believing, uh, you remember the distinction that we made on the first day between the faith that is believed and the faith by which is believed. You see, uh, the faith that is believed is the content of the faith, the faith once for all delivered to the saints. Uh, the whole deposit, the sacred deposit of faith be uh, a good summary of that is uh, in the in the apostles and the Nicene creeds, for example. And also, we mustn't forget as Anglicans the Athanasian creed. Um, a Roman Catholic friend of mine said to me uh, some years ago that Anglicans say the creed more than any other church. The creeds, we say the Apostles' Creed at morning and evening prayer. We say the Nicene Creed at the Eucharist. And we are required, though we don't always uh, fulfill this requirement, also to say the Athanasian Creed from time to time. Um, it's quite salutary for us to do that sometimes. So uh, the faith that is believed, and then there is the faith by which we believe. That is to say, uh, simply believing or saying the creeds is not enough. This has to be personalized and owned. We have to own it. We have to put our trust. Jise Urdu mein bharosa kehte hain, khudavan pe bharosa karna. Put our trust and uh, both these uh, dimensions of uh, right believing have to be kept together. Knowing, believing, and owning. Um, but then, um, as you know, uh, Paul is always strong on the basis of Christian assurance, as was Jesus. The ones uh, that the Father has given me, I have not lost any one of them, you see. Uh, that is the basis for our assurance, the completed work of Jesus Christ. And Paul, again and again, stresses the past reality of salvation. We have been saved by grace through faith, as he says in Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, but as we saw the other day, he also emphasizes the present reality. Work out your salvation, your own salvation, in fear and trembling, for God is at work in you. See, even that working out uh, of our salvation is wholly dependent on God's work. Nevertheless, it's now, it's in the present. And then he looks forward to the future. Those who uh, confess with their lips and believe in their minds, uh, uh, what will, and their hearts, what will happen to them? They will be saved. So there is a future, an eschatological uh, dimension to, to salvation. Um, but he's very conscious himself, uh, and he's also telling uh, his people that there should not be a kind of false confidence about us. Um, in the letter to the Hebrews, we are warned that there are people who have tasted salvation 
and then been found to have rejected Christ. Uh, this was a common experience in the early church. When they were taken to the magistrates, all that was required was for them to say, I have always a little certificate called a libellus. I have always sacrificed to the gods. And to burn a pinch of incense to Caesar and they could go home. We have hundreds of these uh, libelli uh, that people did sign. I, A, B have always sacrifice to the gods, you see. Um, this, uh, those who have tasted salvation can be found to have lost it. And uh, St. Paul says of himself in 1 Corinthians 9, he says, warns himself, lest after having preached to others, you see, I myself should be lost. Um, this is a grave warning <laughs> for preachers. You see, um, not to take lightly the task that we have been given. You see, and so. Uh, here also he is expressing this hope that I may know him, the power of his resurrection, and may share his sufferings. So the meaning of the sharing of Christ's suffering is revealed in his resurrection. You see. That if possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Uh, the New Testament distinguishes between the resurrection of the dead by which is meant the resurrection of believers and unbelievers alike, of the just and the unjust alike, and the resurrection from the dead, which is almost always, I think always spoken of as the resurrection of believers to eternal life. Uh, this distinction is often ignored in some of our modern uh, translations, but I uh, ask you to keep this in mind. Um, at the time of the evangelical revival in the 18th century, there was a dispute between godly people. You can have disputes between godly people um, that don't touch the essentials of the faith, but nevertheless are disputes about important things. And the dispute was between the Wesleys and the reform group led by Whitfield and Simeon about whether we could achieve perfection in this life. And the Wesleys, of course, believed that we could. Uh, we could achieve such perfection. It's all right, thank you. Thank you. I do have a handkerchief in my pocket. Um, I was taught by my mother always to have a clean handkerchief in my pocket. Uh, thank you, Mark. The, um, whereas uh, the, the reform group um, said that this perfection would only come with Christ um, at the end of things. Um, this dispute continues in some ways. If you sing Wesley's hymns, you'll know what I mean. I think in this matter, I am on the side of the Reformed Party, and also, I think, St. Paul, because this is what he's saying, not that I have already obtained this or I'm already perfect. Because in the task of working out my salvation, I press on, he says, to make this my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. You see, the priority again is Christ. Just as God is working in you as you work out your salvation, so here Christ uh, is the priority. Christ Jesus has made me his own, so I press on to make him my own. I mean, that is basically uh, the sense of everything. Brethren, I do not consider that I've made it my own already. You see, there is work still to be done. This is a warning against false confidence. 
a false sense of assurance that leads to antinomianism. It doesn't matter what you do, I've put my trust in Christ, he will save me. Well, he will, yes, but if you read 1 Corinthians 13, you'll see what happens uh, at the end. That every, there is an experience of being burned by fire um, and everything that is unworthy is burnt away. Um, this uh, verse 13, I think, is very important for Christians and especially for Christian leaders. One thing I do, he says, forgetting what lies behind. You see, we are, as Christians, and particularly as Christian leaders, sometimes caught up in our own past, or sometimes even the past of others, maybe uh, the past of our own people. There is a very fine book for the Pakistan group here called The Psychology uh, of a Suppressed People, uh, written by a missionary uh, uh, from Martinpur in the 1930s, I think. It is very illuminating for pastors to read this book because so much of what our people think and do uh, is based on their experience as a suppressed people for hundreds, if not th uh, for maybe thousands of years. And we can become trapped by the past, you see. Uh, St. Paul could have become trapped by his Judaic past, by his experience of persecution, um, by the rejection of what he was preaching by his own people. But what he says is, one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, I strain forward to what lies ahead, you see, looking forward. Looking, of course, forward to the eschaton, to the parousia, to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, that is um, something that must always um, be in our sights. But also looking forward to what God has next for us. Uh, even here, as you know, in the letter to the Philippians, he's a prisoner. But he's looking forward once again to visit his beloved church, the church of the Philippians, you see. He's looking forward to the mission in Spain, to the far west. He's looking forward to the relief of the saints in Jerusalem. Always looking forward, setting goals, achieving goals, moving forward with the help of the Holy Spirit and in Christ. Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. And of course, in the end, that is the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Um, in the New Testament, we have an emerging idea that all of God's people are called to be saints says the 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, it says to all of God's people who are called to be saints. And that is true. Um, that goes right back to the choice of Israel in Exodus chapter 19, uh, to be called God's special people, a priesthood dedicated to God and so on. But there is this idea also emerging that there are some people who are special whose example needs to be followed. Our Lord Jesus Christ, when he comes with all the saints, it says in 1 Thessalonians, uh, the church is built on, in Ephesians chapter 2, on, on what? On Christ Jesus and the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. 
And here also, brethren, he says, join in imitating me. You see, he has presented Christ as the supreme exemplar, but here, what does it say in Hebrews? We are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, and we have come to the spirits of just, of the just made perfect. They have perfection. Join in imitating me and mark those who so live as you have an example in us. So it's not just Paul who is to be, to be imitated uh, but, uh, and followed, but those who have followed him. You see. A great cloud of witnesses indeed for 2,000 years. But then there are the others who are not to be imitated. You see, there's always the shadow side, who are not to be followed, who are enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly and their glory is their shame. With their minds are set on earthly things. Now, uh, from time to time, this can be a, des a description of each one of us. I mean, let's be honest. But, um, It is a great sadness that even of Christian leaders, of Christian clergy, of Christian ministers, this can be a description. You see, whose God is their belly, always looking for the next freebie, the next free meal, the next free treat. Their glory is in their shame. They glorify what should be shameful. They boast about it. And their minds are set on the merely earthly. You see, they have no vision to look upwards beyond the usual problems of the day. But he says, our, our citizenship really, I was so glad that Archbishop Okor yesterday read uh, from the letter to Diognetus, the second century letter, uh, and you, you heard it all, of course, when he read it out, but this is where Diognetus gets it from. Our citizenship, my translation says Commonwealth. I don't know what other translations say here. What other translations have you got? What does this one say? Yes, our citizenship is in heaven, that one says. That's good. Any other translations? What does the Arabic say? Uh, verse 20. Mawatniya? What does the Farsi say, uh, Abdi? Read verse 20, please. Shahariyat. Huh? Sorry? Mawatniyat? Oh, I see. Saratna. Uh, what does Urdu say? Marawa? Watan, yeah. Okay. Homeland. Homeland, yes, right. Okay. Commonwealth. Our citizenship is in heaven. You see. And from it we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the basic point, that our citizenship is not 
in the end here. Everything here is provisional. Everything here is provisional. That was what Diognetus was saying, you see. Uh, that even when we are at home, we are aliens. You see, we do not really belong because we are followers of Christ. Um, and I think uh, over the centuries, the church has compromised uh, on many occasions on this matter. We become far too much at home when we should not be so much at home. We have not really understood that our status derives from heaven and not from earth, not by any earthly belonging, whether it is family or nationality or ethnicity or language or whatever. But our citizenship, our commonwealth is in heaven. So that is the corporate reality of the church. And then in the last verse, he comes to the personal. What will Christ do? He will change our lowly body to be his glorious body. Our defective, weak, aging, disabled bodies will be changed to be like his risen body. You see, there is a deep theology of the body here. You see, the body is God's creation. As we were hearing yesterday, we strongly believe in God as creator, but the body is also the result of sin, as Rico and Shedi were saying yesterday. Uh, the weakness of our bodies is the result of our rebellion and of our sin. And that body has to be, this is part of God's redemptive work, that, this, that body, that fallen body, has to be restored into the likeness of that image in which it was created in the first place. And how do we know it will be changed like that? Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. See, that is the basis uh, of our hope. He will change our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power which enables him even to subject all things to himself. So this redemption and restoration is not limited to us individually. It is not limited even to the church, but it is the restoration of the whole of the cosmos. I mean, this is what he brings out more clearly in the letter that follows, in the letter to the Colossians. This is part of God's redemptive, restorative plan in which we are privileged to participate. So I'm very glad, brothers and sisters, that um, St. Paul did not stop at chapter 3, verse 1. Otherwise, we would not have all these wonderful truths uh, that we can benefit from uh, personally, uh, as a church, and also for the sake of our world. Now unto God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, be all might, majesty, honor, and glory, now and forever.